The final item of business is Members Business Debate on Motion 16015 in the name of Andy Whiteman on Who Owns Scotland? This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons. And I call on Andy Whiteman to open the debate for around seven minutes, please. Thank you very much, <coughs> Presiding Officer. I refer members to my register of interest, in particular to my ongoing administration of the Who Owns Scotland website. I'm pleased to open this debate uh, today and thank all members who signed uh, the motion and who are speaking this afternoon. Uh, this debate is intended to highlight the need for a wide range of information, not just the ownership of land, to be more easily and freely available. It's something of a contradiction uh, that Scotland has the oldest national public register of land, the 1617 Register of Sacenes, and yet today it has a system of land registration and land information that is poor by international standards and where it is next to impossible to obtain critical information easily and quickly. In 2018, Transparency International published a framework for assessing the transparency of land ownership information. Scotland was one of the case studies, and in Community Land Scotland's report towards land ownership transparency in Scotland, the authors concluded that, and I quote, there is currently a gap between the desire for a publicly accessible land registry and the reality. Access for citizens to anything other than the most basic information is fragmented, fragmented expensive, and complicated. And I want to emphasize at the outset that a land information system involves much more than ownership. It includes, yes, of course, information on ownership and associated legal entities, but also valuation data, non-domestic rates, council tax, planning permissions, environmental and heritage designations, energy performance certificate ratings, flood risks, contaminated land, utilities data, coastal and marine data, and the list goes on. Now, in Scotland today, all of this information is available in theory but it is difficult, time-consuming, and expensive to obtain. For example, a constituent of mine was concerned about short-term lets in her tenement in Edinburgh. There were five in all. She wanted to know who owned them, whether they had planning consent, and whether they were paying their local taxes. Now, such a task should be straightforward with a modern land information system. But not only must she look in three different places, but the ownership information alone would cost her £150 plus VAT, money she did not have. And it's worth noting that we were far better informed historically. In 1872, the government conducted a survey and published a full return of the owners of lands and heritages. And I have a copy here if anyone's interested uh, in perusing it. And it is an odd state of affairs that it's easier to find out the ownership, value and use of land in 1915 than it is in 2018, because following the Finance Act of 1910, Lloyd George's famous People's Budget proposed a levy on the value of land and in order to establish a baseline, surveyors mapped out in intricate detail the ownership, the occupation, the value and the use of virtually all of Great Britain and the whole of the island of Ireland, covering 99.7% of the land area of Scotland and nothing comparable has been produced since. Other countries such as Norway, Singapore, US states and European countries such as Sweden, Netherlands and Estonia are well ahead of us. Indeed, in a ranking of countries uh, by the ease of registering property, for example, the World Bank ranks the UK number 42 in the world. Above us are Rwanda, Belarus, Slovakia, Latvia, Finland and Kosovo. One of the best examples of uh, information is the cadastral service of the US state of Montana. You can go online, do it now if you fancy, and you can examine a wide range of information relating to every parcel of land in Montana from your computer or smartphone here in Edinburgh. You can even find out how many bathrooms folk have and the type of heating systems uh, they use. England and Wales, too, are making greater progress. For example, in the Land Registry of England and Wales, online, uh, you can enter a postcode, pay a fee of six pounds and download the information. In Scotland, this will cost you 30 pounds and cannot be done online by the user. And more widely, the UK Geospatial Commission has been set up and is running with a mission to make geospatial data available for free and without restriction. Presiding officer, my motion notes another issue of relevance to this debate. In 2014, following the publication of the final report of the Land Reform Review Group, they committed to complete, uh, the government committed to complete the land register by 2024 and to have all public land registered by 2019. Now, as revealed in correspondence with the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee towards the end of last year, however, the public land target will not be achieved. 
Edinburgh Council said it has neither the resources nor the budget to accomplish the task in the envisaged timescale. Stirling Council said that it will not complete. Highland Council said it would cost them £8.5 million uh, to do so. And all of this begs the question, who is accountable for this policy? In discussions with the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland at the Economy Committee in January, she claimed she's doing all she can. Local authorities in particular can't afford to provide the information and appear never to have been consulted about the target in the first place. But regardless of how complete the land register is, and latest data shows that 66% of the 2 million units of property are on it, representing 33% of the land area, it remains impossible to easily and quickly identify and secure access to this and a wide range of other information. Now, all of this looked as if it might change in 2015. Following a report in July 2015, John Swinney announced in October 2015 the establishment of Scotless, Scottish Land Information Service, an online portal that would, and I quote, enable citizens, communities, professionals and businesses to access comprehensive information about any piece of land or property in Scotland. Scotland was delivered in November 2017, but it did not and does not deliver on the commitment made by Scottish ministers in 2015. Indeed, it is next to useless. Members can have a look for, for themselves online. Uh, most particularly, it is not comprehensive. It only includes some of the information held by the Registers of Scotland, and you have to pay for it. The public, in particular, receive a much inferior offering than do business users, who not only enjoy easier and better access, but are charged 10% of the fees that the public are. Like the completion target, government policy is not being delivered. Now, I'd welcome the Minister's views on why this is the case and who is actually responsible, because from what I can tell, governance is the key failing. The system should never have been placed under the control of Registers of Scotland. Such an ambitious project requires a broad governance structure that includes COSLA, public agencies such as SEPA and SNH, the voluntary and community sector, valuation boards and others. And most importantly, it requires leadership by government, a broad governing delivery board, an agreed design delivery plan and timetable, accountability for its delivery, and requires to be developed to match the best in the world. Presenting officer, none of this is difficult. But for far too long, the people of Scotland have been unable to find out information about who owns their country and about the value and use of land and property. Citizens, in my view, have the right to openness and transparency in relationship to information held by public authorities about land. And it's their right, and it's the responsibility of this Parliament and Scottish ministers to ensure that its stated policy goals are delivered on time and in full. And in particular, to conclude, we need a new work programme and a governance framework to deliver the ambitions of the Scottish land information system as a matter of some urgency. Thank you. Uh, we move to the open debate. Speeches of up to four minutes, please. Gillian Martin, followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. And I want to thank Andy Whiteman for bringing his well-documented specialism to the Chamber and indeed for all his work over the years in bringing issues around the lack of transparency around land ownership into a mainstream discussion, a discussion that fueled a lot of the debate in the independence campaign when we, more than any other time, started to compare our country to other northern European countries where people's ownership of, of those countries' land is seen more as a right rather than a privilege reserved to a wealthy few. Uh, the availability and, uh, of accessible and free information on who owns and controls every piece of Scotland, I think, is also a right. And one of my first duties as the convener of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee was to oversee a report, one of report that Andy Whiteman mentioned, um, on how the Register of Persons with a Controlling Interest in Land will work. And I think the creation of this register will go a long way to address issues around transparency and the fulfilling of the right of ordinary Scots to get information on who owns and controls the land around them. Um, the issues raised in Mr Whiteman's motion around ease of access to information was forefront in our minds as we questioned stakeholders and the keeper of the register. And this resource uh, should make it easy to locate and contact anyone with a controlling interest in a piece of land. Particularly one of the issues has been that people are fronting up for the people who do will have the controlling interest and they will no longer be able to be hiding behind any kind of front of, of uh, a person that couldn't actually answer questions. It should, be, it should be easy to locate and my understanding of the, the evidence that the, the keeper gave us that this process is underway in making this website to the standard of which what, what Mr Whiteman has just been saying it should be at. That seemed to be something that I thought was, was, was uh, underway, um, certainly from her evidence. 
Um, there was also a great deal of debate on um, around the penalties that were in place for people who didn't put their information on this uh, um, resource as, as well. And uh, the committee was quite uh, upfront in recommending that they, the penalties not be, just look like the cost of hiding what you own. Um, they should be meaningful. Um, one issue Mr Whiteman brought up was having every piece of information in, in one place and the, the Keeper of Controlling Interest Register said that users would be signposted to other registers without duplicating other publicly available information, without the need for double reporting or the register becoming too unwieldy a resource. Uh, we, we do not want any loopholes or any ways opening up that mean that those responsible for land can hide any information. And we questioned her directly on the user friendliness of the website interface that would make access to all the registers intuitive and straightforward and crucially without cost. And that was a recommendation we made in our report. Um, the Keeper said in her evidence, and I'll quote her directly, it almost does not matter that the information is kept in separate registers. What matters is how we allow people to bring together and aggregate the information when they view it. Under their proposal for introducing the register, Scotless, Scotland's Land Information Service will, for example, allow someone to look at a piece of land and then look through to see whether a controlled interest is registered for that land. It will be seamless for the person who's looking. They will not know that the information about the controlled interest is held in a separate database. They will be able to see all the information that's been drawn together, so that's a much more elegant solution. It's my understanding that that uh, work is ongoing. But before I sit down, presiding officer, one issue I do want to raise is the problem of long-term unused rural buildings that are left to rot. The land registry will assist communities and individuals being able to put their finger on the ownership of such properties. But it's my view that some thought also has to be given to how long we allow empty rural estate farm properties to stand vacant and to what condition we allow them to deteriorate. I think it's an environmental issue but it's also a social justice issue particularly in areas where lack of affordable housing in rural areas struggle uh, and areas that struggle to keep their young people like the constituency of, of the minister I commend the work done by the Scottish Government in the empty homes partnership that's brought over 700 empty homes back into use I but, to I, draw to a close, yeah. please. but I, I agree also agree with the empty homes partnership that there calls for compulsory sale order power for vacant and derelict land and buildings I'll end there presiding officer and thank Andy Whiteman once again Finlay Carson, followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased that Andy Whiteman has brought to this important subject to the Chamber this evening and for the opportunity to set out my own thoughts on it. As a member of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee, I had the chance to take part in the evidence sessions regarding uh, the register of persons owning land across Scotland and its objective of increasing public transparency in relation to individuals who have control over decision making in relation to land. The sentiments put forward by Andy Whiteman this evening in his motions are ones that I and my Conservative colleagues largely share, particularly in relation to transparency. But I, I do also have concerns over uh, how the information that we gather will be resilient and future-proof. At the evidence session last year, I raised my concerns over the use of snail mail as the method taken as the best point of contact for people to access uh, owners through the register. I, I, I do believe that the register should have the flexibility to adapt to the fast-paced technological times we are living in. And given that electronic signatures and electronic personal identification and authentication is now becoming a commonplace as contactless, as contactless payments, that should certainly have been considered. <coughs> Excuse me. During the evidence sessions, I pointed out that email is now more often than not the default way for people in terms of communication. And I felt that more could have been included alongside, that could have been included alongside a geographical address. And this could also have aided in just in the speed of uh, processing registrations. As Andy Whiteman's motion points out, the government's target for registering all land by the end of 2019 is very unlikely to be reached. Uh, indeed, only a few days after that particular evidence session, it emerged from the new Keeper of the Registers of Scotland that there was a backlog of about 40,000 registration applications. Many applications are taking two years or longer, which is sim simply unacceptable, which was acknowledged by the new Keeper. 56% of the registrations had not met the target process time, something which we must all acknowledge and improve. Local authorities are way behind schedule and the government must use a carrot and stick approach to get back to somewhere near the target. 
But a balance must be struck in terms of ensuring the process works and in a suitable timescale and the data is robust and secure. Indeed, ensuring an adequate level of data security and privacy remains critical. There's also concerns surrounding the identification of individuals and their names and addresses. For example, south of the border, farmers whose information has been published have been the target of protesters, resulting in protests at farm gates and individuals' houses. In some instances, this caused serious disturbances and damage to property and livestock. This was a result of full details of farmers being published on the Food Standard Agency England website. And thankfully, we don't have any plans to do that up here. I did raise the aspect of privacy in committee, pointing out that the registered landowner should perhaps provide a response or information to any query within an appropriate timescale, but that could be provided through the address of an agent or a lawyer's office, office with personal address details possibly made uh, public uh, it, it makes real difficulties and, and I look to the Scottish Government to let us know what protective measures will be put in place to ensure farmers or indeed any landowners are, uh, will be protected from the possibility of intimidation or threats associated with the land that they own or what they do with that land. As, with, as we advance in technology, there's going to be a greater and greater demand for our constituents who will want uh, information represented simply, quickly and transparently, and the land registry is no different. And it shouldn't be different, difficult or costly to access that data. I do disagree with the part of the motion which suggests there should be a, a value, uh, because the value, as I would uh, believe, changes, and it's the market that actually dictates that it could change on a daily basis. But it certainly is all about making that no, process Mr. open Finley's and closing. easy for constituents Sorry, to access. Mr. The land registry is a system that must do what it was set out to do, but a system which ensures the rights of, of landowners are sufficiently protected. I welcome Andy No, you'll, you'll have to close tonight. rather than welcome anything else, Mr. Carson. Well, I hope the system is fit for purpose. <laughs> Thank you, presiding officer. And my apologies for referring to you as Mr. Finlay earlier. <laughs> um, Rhoda Grant, followed by Gail Ross. Thank you, presiding officer, and can I too congratulate Andy Whiteman on securing this debate and also apologise to the Chamber as I am unable to stay for the whole of the debate. Presiding officer, land is an asset and is also an economic driver. Land reform was demanded because too often the beneficial owner of the land was a dead hand over communities. Their action or their lack of it stopped community development and forced people off the land. The ability to develop the local economy was, is very difficult if you can't work with the landowner, but if you can't trace them, it becomes impossible. In the Highlands and Islands where Crofton tenure is common, it's imperative to be able to deal with the landowner if you want to develop your croft, diversify your business or install re renewable energy. You need the landlord's permission for all of that. If you don't know who the owner is and their agent will not work with you, any development that you would wish to undertake is blocked. You cannot then appeal to the landowner because you have no knowledge of who they are or where they're based. A faceless somebody who holds your future in their hands, but with whom you cannot communicate. Frankly, where owners are proving to be a dead hand over the land, we need to remove the land from them and make it a driver for economic growth and repopulation. However, until we have the ability to do that, the very least we need to know is who they are and to hold them to account. Community Land Scotland's report towards land ownership transparency reminds us that part three of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 deals with the ownership of land. And the report covers many aspects of ownership and access to information, and I would recommend it uh, for reading. But I want to focus on identifying beneficial owners because I have tried with my constituents to trace landowners and found it impossible. And this has to be this has to change. They need to be able to be identified. The Scottish Government have yet to publish the regulations on the registering of controlling interests, but in the opinion of Community Land Scotland, these regulations are unlikely to change the transparency of land ownership in Scotland. And this is incredibly disappointing because it seems very odd and wrong that I can walk on a croft of land, be entitled to view publicly available and free to access register, which tells me who that crofter is, yet the ownership of the land on which the crofter has their tenancy 
might may remain secret. What is good enough for the crofter should be good enough for the landowner too. And one of the reasons for this is that overseas entities will not be required to disclose beneficial ownership. So unless there is a way of tracing that in their country of origin, this will remain secret. This in itself could encourage landowners to set up offshore companies to avoid traceability. We see state agents selling land, emphasising its use as, tax, as a tax avoidance measure. If that's the motivation of a buyer or an owner, then setting up a business in a tax haven would also be a measure that they would consider, and already too many overseas owners cannot be traced. We need laws and regulations that would make, make it impossible for a beneficial owner to hide. With the ownership of land comes responsibility for the communities that live on that land. How can a landowner be held responsible if they can't be traced? The Highland Clearance has brutally removed people from the land they called home and replaced them with sheep. So much history and culture was lost, and even sadly, sadly, even today, the effects of that are still felt in our empty glens. We need to stop these practices happening again. Lack of transparency on who owns Scotland is allowing that to happen, and it needs to change. Gail Ross, followed by Edward Mountain. Thank you, President Officer. I would also like to thank my colleague Andy Whiteman for bringing this debate to the Chamber today. The only surprise is that it took him so long. I would also um, like to take this opportunity, as I do whenever I can, to thank my predecessor, Rob Gibson, for all his tireless work on land reform and registration. I know that he and Andy Whiteman have often worked together on this subject, sometimes even successfully. President Officer, Scotland has one of the most unequal patterns of land ownership in Europe. You only need to read Andy Whiteman's book, The Poor Had No Lawyers, to really understand how land ownership in Scotland works. And I would particularly recommend the chapter in which he forensically scrutinises the ownership of the Cullen when it went up for sale in 2000. At the moment, as soon as a land or a building changes hands, it is required to be registered. The property registers, of which there are 20 public, are maintained by the keeper and supported by staff at the registers of Scotland. But what about the land that is not changing hands? As Andy Whiteman's motion points out, there are targets for the registering of land, 2019 for public land and 2024 for land in private ownership. I recently asked the Scottish Government how much of the land register is completed and the Minister told me that as of the 31st of January 2009, there are 1,808,661 titles on the land register, which represents 66.7% of the total. The land mass this represents is only 33.8% of Scotland's circa 8 million hectares. We all agree that land ownership in Scotland needs to be transparent, but this requires time, funds and political will. We have the first and the third, but the second, the funds, are indeed limited. And as Andy Whiteman has already said, the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee recently wrote to local authorities in Scotland to see if they were confident of hitting the 2019 target. The City of Edinburgh Council said it was not likely. Stirling Council said the Council will not complete the registration by 2019. Aberdeen City Council said it won't be able to because we have no resources available. So work does have to be done to help local authorities complete this work. Of the targets, the Keeper of the Register said, we are working as hard as we can to meet the target, but the completion of the register requires lots of organisations to submit information to us. It is helpful that ministers have set out that aspiration. Presiding officer, comprehensive multi-layered land registers can take decades to complete. Spain and Switzerland have systems that are amongst the best in the world, and the cadastral system in Switzerland began in the early 19th century. The official Swiss Federal Land Registry has been operational since 1912, and since then, all land ownership throughout that country has been secured by official entry into their land register. Transparency in land ownership is a fundamental lever of SM policy, uh, SMP policy for land reform. But it is a journey that still has a long way to go due to so many powers over land still residing with Westminster. Now, Andy Whiteman will be aware of Popea Daniel's independent research published just last year. In fact, I believe that he actually contributed to it. And the research makes the following observations. 
Better information will enable, will enable better communication and help communities better influence land-related decisions which affect them. Better information on patterns of ownership will promote better understanding of equalities relating to land and help promote fair and equal access. And better information on influences on land use, ownership and transfer will help design better land policy. We all want to see more transparent land ownership and the debate is still open about how we get there. Thank you. Edward Mountain, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And before I start, I'd like to refer members to my register of interest. I'd like to thank Andy Whiteman for securing this debate, and I'd be, like to say that I share with him the need for openness and transparency when it comes to land ownership. I think there's nothing it sh should be ashamed of when it comes to owning land. And let's be clear, there are lots of groups and bodies around Scotland who do own land. Now, Andy, you, you Mr. Whiteman, sorry, Mr. Whiteman asked a question, presiding officer, I'll get this right in a minute. Mr. Whiteman asked a question on uh, valuations, and I'm going to trust my speech to allow a question to come back on that particular subject, because I know at a later stage, uh, the, there will be a moment to come in. If I could just make a bit of headway and then allow you to come in, I think the point will become clear then. I think, let's be clear, the Scottish Government own a huge amount of land, uh, not only because they manage the National Forest Estate, but also there's land ownership as far as the Crown Estate concerned, that's 91,000 acres covering farming, residential, commercial, sporting and minerals operations. There's also charities that own a lot of land, National Trust for Scotland owning 190,000 acres, RSPB Scotland owning over 120,000 acres, with an ambition to double that by 2030. And in the last 20 years, we've seen a lot of rise in community land ownership, with 400 groups now owning just over half a million acres in total. And I believe that Scotland is becoming, a, is becoming a situation where there is a diverse mix of private individuals, businesses, public bodies and charities, and communities owning land. Now, I just want to say I believe, and I've stressed at the beginning, that the public have a right and to have an interest in who owns Scotland. And we, the Conservatives, agree with the principle that information on land ownership should be open and transparent and readily available on a register. We can't see any need for secrecy. And I also believe that it's very important that land managers are clearly identifiable at all stages so that people who want to use and access that land or have an interest in it know who to contact. Now, the point I agree, disagree with Andy Whiteman on is the fact of the need to value land. <clears throat> As an ex-surveyor, I can tell you land values are very subjective, and actually it's very difficult, and the only person that can really put a value on the land is the market. So, while I still agree with transaction values should be based on when they are published, asking landowners to submit land values for their land would be expensive and of little use. For example, I will just, if I can just finish this bit, Mr. Whiteman, to value a small parcel of land, say of 500 acres, using a definition of valuation used by surveyors, may cost in the region of £3,000. And I really question if that is money well spent. I don't think it is. Mr. Whiteman. Andy Whiteman. Thank Mr. Mountain for giving way. And I just want to respond to him and his colleague, uh, Mr. Carson, on this valuation point. At the heart of my motion <coughs> is the suggestion that existing sources of information should be more easily available in one place. And the valuation information that I'm talking about is the valuation information held by the Scottish assessors. I'm not actually asking for any new valuations. I'm just asking for existing data to be made much more easily available, integrated with other data. Edward Mountain. And Thank you, Mr. Whiteman, for, for making that point. And I think that's something that we can sign up to. If the information there is on, la on land transactions, I think it's very important that they are published and are easily to get to. But I think that what the whole issue of land ownership loses the fact that probably the most important thing to take into account is what's done with the land. Now, it does matter to me, for example, that the Forestry Commission's figures show that since 1999, they have sold 64,000 hectares of forestry and only bought 34,000 hectares of forestry. We need to know that, and the public have a right to know that, because that contravenes the Parliament's policy on the repositioning of, of Scotland's woodland estate. So, presiding officer, I welcome the moves of transparency when it comes to land ownership information. We should know who knows what in the countryside, and indeed within our cities, and there should be no problems with including details of who to contact regarding land. But we must not lose sight in the, in the rush to do this, which is correct, 
that it is what happens to that land that is critically important, and that is what we value. So whilst I support some of Andy Whiteman's yeah, calls must for trans post, please. I don't support it all. Thank you, presiding officer. The last of the open debate contributions is from Claudia Beamish. Thank you, presiding officer. This is indeed a timely debate on a motion about who owns Scotland by the author of the book by that very title. It seems appropriate that Andy Whiteman has secured this debate as I readily acknowledge that it is his work and passion for the subject of land ownership transparency that has helped shed light on exactly who does own Scotland. Andy Whiteman's work builds on that of the late John McEwen, who devoted a lifetime to opening up understanding of Scotland's anachronistic and wholly unjust land ownership patterns. But as far as the work of these, of, of these two have taken us, there still remains altogether too much secrecy around land ownerships. These issues matter. The few who own land hold great power and influence over the many who occupy it, ex explore, ex explore it and look at it. Now, the land, how the land is managed has profound implications for a range of issues and I'm going to highlight some of them. The scenic qualities of our landscape and how we enjoy it, whether that land is ecologically sound or in decline, whether the land supports our needs as climate change accelerates, whether it supports vital economic activity and creates economic opportunity for the many and not just the few, whether it provides for our national housing needs, whether our sources of water supplies are of good quality and that the land management contributes to or mitigates flood risks and much, much more. Land use is to a very large extent the consequence of the preference of the owners of that land. So land ownership is vital to use. And Andy Whiteman has highlighted a range of other related matters which are relevant here. We are all affected by the ways in which I have just, just illustrated. Also, knowing who owns all our land, urban and rural, is vital as communities wanting to negotiate a purchase, of course, can't do it unless they know who the landowner is and of fundamental importance how to contact them. Having free access to such land ownership details is part of the land justice approach that Labour has and many others in this chamber have as well. We, the people of our nation, have the right to know. Too much of that land ownership is secretive still. Owners hiding behind shell companies, sometimes in overseas territories, which hide their identity. One has to ask why and whether that can be in the public interest. I say it is in the public interest that who owns Scotland is entirely transparent. The only exception should be where secrecy is justified to protect someone from harm, such as anyone in an abusive relationship. There should be no more hiding ownerships as a matter of preference of owners, uh, in, not in such circumstances. Today's debate is an opportunity for the Minister to update us on the progress that Parliament has long been seeking in opening up land ownership information. Andy, White, Andy Whiteman's motion mentions Community Land Scotland report towards land ownership transparency. That report signals that Scotland could become a world leader in these matters, but it has to want to be so. So perhaps the Minister in her reply can be clear if this is the ambition of the Scottish Government and does it want to take a lead on these matters. The Minister will recall that as she piloted, uh, the, the previous Minister, sorry, um, piloted the last land reform bill through Parliament, it was then amended by one of her, the, her own backbenchers, then backbencher, Graham Day. This was an amendment crafted by Community Land Scotland, a global witness, and it provided provisions for a truly radical advance and along with Scottish Labour spokesperson on land at the time, Sarah Boyack, I was pleased to support Graham Day in this. The government subsequently moved to replace the amendment with the promise of something even better to be achieved through the use of regulations. That was a couple of years ago and progress has been slow. So can the minister also confirm that we'll now expect to see this matter completed quickly? And can she confirm, finally, that the proposals will fully meet the will of parliament to have this matter resolved finally and in the interest of the people in Scotland to have a completely open and free access, free I stress, to the details of who owns Scotland. Thank you.
I now call on Kate Forbes to respond to the debate for around seven minutes. Please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And there's a lot of areas that have been raised, and I will certainly try and cover those areas. But hopefully we can return to uh, this debate in future days, weeks and months as well, because um, now that it is part of my portfolio and it's an area where I have a very personal interest in these matters um, over the course of the last few months have taken a, a very active interest in, in the way in which Registers of Scotland is progressing plans and also the point that's been made quite um, frequently in this debate around the political will that's there. To answer Claudia Beamish's question to begin with, I think we absolutely do want to be a world leader when it comes to transparency. But at a time of, of change, transformation, transition, there's clearly um, further that we need to go. And the report that's referenced in Andy Whiteman's um, motion makes that clear. It identified a number of positive steps that had already been made, but highlighted uh, the need to go further. Because clearly land is one of Scotland's key assets, if not the key asset. And our land reform agenda has got to be based on simple, transparent understanding of land. We have got to be transparent around who owns, manages and uses land. But the point that's been made around valuation is, is very interesting because I, of course, also have um, two other hats around public finance and the digital, digital government. And one of the things that I'm actively looking at at the moment, although I'm not making any promises just now, is the way in which other countries have used and made, um, a, for example, the non-domestic rates uh, information far more accessible, not just to ratepayers themselves, but more generally, and the way in which particularly Northern Ireland is, is a good example, and I don't know if, if Andy Whiteman has any opinions on that, but the way in which we make sure that ratepayers, businesses, individuals, citizens can access um, far more information around valuations um, through a very simple a simple portal and I'm currently looking at what kind of prototype we could develop in Scotland to make sure that existing data that we hold is made available to the public and that portal can then be uh, expanded to include information around planning as well as um, registration but that is a, a far more uh, that's a far broader issue. And of course, transparency is not limited to just information about who owns land. It also critically applies to what land is used for. And uh, the Scottish Land Rights and Responsibilities Statement and our guidance on engaging communities in decisions relating to land both encourage those who make decisions about land to engage with communities so that they understand what the land is being used for and why. And I completely agree with the point that Rhoda Grant made that often um, if there is a strained relationship or a community doesn't even know, know who owns it, there's an inability to uh, engage properly. So the, the point around the, the report, the Community Land Scotland report highlighted strengths of the current system, but also pointed the way to necessary improvements. And there are several works. Yes, Andy Whiteman. Minister for taking intervention. One of the points the report highlights is the fact that um, for a member of the public, like my constituent, um, it costs £30 plus VAT. Um, for a business user, for Scotland's biggest law firms, it costs £3. Now, these fees are set out in a fee order introduced by ministers, passed by Parliament. I think the last one was in 2014. Does she have any uh, plans to consult on any new fee orders? And would you use that opportunity uh, to introduce a, a rather more uh, benign and fair fee system? Kate Forbes. Well, I'm pleased to be able to respond to that question quite positively because in coming months, citizens will be able to download and purchase a copy of property information from Scotless for £3. And in, that includes the title plan and title sheet. Previously, that had been available through the customer services at a fee of up to £30 plus VAT. So I can give the assurance that we are seeking to change uh, those fees to make it more accessible um, for um, ordinary citizens. 
which does take me on to uh, Scotless, which is, of course, the new map-based online land information service in October 2017. And again, with my digital hat on and looking at the different ways that different parts of government are trying to digitise, I have to say I am quite impressed with the way in which Registers of Scotland have adopted a more digital system, to Finlay Carson's point about the changing um, ways in which we communicate and are able to submit information. I do think it's quite an impressive uh, system System. I do, however, think that it is on a, on a journey, as it were. So, for the first time, Scotless provides online public access to information about land and property held on the register, um, including title numbers, property prices, boundaries and sales information. But we need to continually develop it, and new features are constantly being introduced for both businesses and citizens based on feedback. And I know that there's an open invitation to any member who wants to go and visit Registers of Scotland to see it in action. In terms of um, the point around uh, public bodies and the targets there, um, it does depend on collaboration. There is progress being made. I recognise that the point around um, not meeting the, the target by the end of 2019, but uh, Registers of Scotland are also working on a programme of keeper-induced registration of some public sector property and have registered over... Yeah. Edward Mountain. Sorry. Uh, very briefly, Minister, when you were on the REC committee, I think you sat in on the report on crofting and crofters found it very difficult and didn't have the funds to complete the register and they were very, very keen to do it. And the committee felt it was a very good idea to do it, as far as I remember. Can I just ask, are you going to make funds available, more funds available to them to allow them to continue the registration process, which we, everyone seems to think is so vital, and I agree with? Kate Forbes. Yes, yeah, so I think it's not just about funding, if I could say that. It's also about registers of Scotland coming alongside individuals who are trying to register and support and guide them. Because I think the point that was made is funding is a challenge and funding is a challenge when it comes to public bodies. That is one of the reasons that has been highlighted in this debate already. But there's also a question of priorities too. And, um, and busy people, particularly when it comes to crofters and farmers, and being able to support them with the expertise, the guidance, um, and come alongside them. Um, so it's certainly something that I would be very happy to consider. It's Register of Scotland obviously receives no public funds and it's entirely self-funding from the fees it charges and the services it provides. And that means that, for example, the cost of providing information requires to be met either by those accessing the information as at present or subsidised by home buyers through higher land register fees. But I believe it's right that those who want information um, are able to access that information. And there's been no increase in fees or the fees charged for access to information since 2011. Presiding officer, I realise that I'm now well over time. So I just want to conclude by saying that the land reform agenda, in which I believe passionately, depends on information, transparent information about land, about its ownership, about its use, about its management. And as a uh, minister now with responsibility of registers of Scotland, I take that very seriously. That concludes the debate and this meeting is closed.